and um, they made a lot of product in that fashion, and now they're they're making their own bourbon again. Um, this is grandfather with his uh, some of his brothers, a big family in, in Bartstown, and uh, their their um, big label at the time when I was a child was called Old Bartstown. That's the name of this uh, racehorse. You can see the the painting of the horse here that grandfather's holding, and the horse the horse himself. And this is a picture from the distillery still. Any folks actually from Kentucky here? There's got to be some folks from Kentucky. Because I was thinking about, somebody came to Maryland and talked about their connections to Maryland. We have about two people in our department who are actually from, from Maryland. But uh, I thought the folks from Kentucky might, might appreciate this. And, um, if you ever get a chance, if you haven't visited Bartstown, it's a, it's a really nice spot to, to go visit. In addition to all the distilleries, a very historic town. I think my, my uncle's actually mayor right now of, of Bartstown, so it's, it's really nice spot. We were just back there um, a month or two ago. My, my children love, love to visit my, my family there. Um, so with that, I, I also, since um, this was mentioned, I'm the chair of the department at, at Maryland. I uh, thought I'd say a few words about the University of Maryland and our, our department there. Um, similar to here, we're a relatively new, new department. We had a graduate program that started in, in 2002. And then in 2006, uh, uh, Dr. Bob Fischel uh, donated uh, over $30 million to endow the Fischel Department of Bioengineering. So we had the graduate program, we added an undergraduate program, and then built the department um, from, that, from that time. Um, so right now we're about uh, a little bit over 500 undergraduates, so that's somewhere in the, like, the top 10 in terms of size of undergraduate programs. We have about 100 graduate students uh, the vast majority of which are, are PhD students. We'd like to see that number continue to grow. We have about 20 faculty members, and we're somewhere around 14 or $15 million in, in research expenditures. Um, it's really a great spot where we've been fortunate, um, as, as you all hear, we've been fortunate to uh, um, be able to recruit some outstanding young faculty. I just showed two here. Uh, Kim Stroka, she actually did her PhD with us and did a postdoc at Hopkins, and we were able to recruit her back. Um, and then Greg Duncan is also a Johns Hopkins person. There are some of our new assistant professors, both of which won the um, Burroughs Welcome Career Award. Um, I don't think there are too many departments that have two professors that um, won, won this award. So our, our joke now is, come to Maryland, you too can win the Burroughs, career, well, <laughs> Burroughs Welcome Career Award. And then finally, um, uh, similar, similar to here at Louisville, we've just opened up a a new building that's called uh, Clark Hall. You can see the building up on the top left. Um, so we're the Clark School of, of Engineering. A. James Clark um, was an alum from the School of Engineering. He um, was a civil engineering uh, student, went into the construction business, and eventually became president of CEO and CEO of, uh, it's big on the East Coast, what's known as Clark, Clark Construction. He was a very good friend and benefactor of the School of Engineering and um, um, uh, donated funds in addition to a lot of things, donated funds to um, help uh, get this building on, on track. So the building opened in early uh, 2018. We moved in at, at that time. It's a six story, it's about a hundred and, um, it's about 180,000 square feet, about $160 million uh, facility. Uh, it has floors that are campus, uh, um, college wide and then the department, as well as we have an institute associated with the department, are all housed in this building. So Maryland, we're inside the DC Beltway. We're like right in the northeast corner of the DC Beltway in, in College Park. If you're ever in DC and, and uh, want to stop by and, and say hello, we'd be uh, thrilled to have you um, uh, come by and, and visit, and I'd be happy to, to show you around. So getting to um, my work, um, as was mentioned, uh, our lab does a lot of work in, in materials and, and tissue engineering and uh, a lot of printing work that I'll talk about uh, for, for a minute. But just as a kind of introduction, when you think about the, the history of materials and the concepts that were driving materials developments over, over the decades, um, first folks were really thinking about materials and the idea that we wanted to plant something that was relatively inert to the surrounding biological system. Um, over time, people thought, you know, maybe we want materials that have more activity to respond, and then ultimately materials that have some regenerative properties. 
So this has been driving a, a lot of work in, in tissue engineering, um, but the question is how, how do we take polymers, material, uh, metals, ceramics, and how do we form them into useful three-dimensional um, biomedical devices? So our lab and, and many, many labs have used um, additive manufacturing approaches to, to build um, <coughs> implantable um, biomaterial-based uh, products. Um, as I learned quite a bit um, during my time here, uh, uh, folks here do a lot of work in, in printing technologies, uh, light-based printing, powder-based printing, extrusion uh, printing, for a variety of applications. So in dentistry, the work in tissue models has been going on for, for years and years. Uh, surgery, medical devices, even more uh, uh, recently things, building drugs and, and drug formulations using, using uh, printing approaches. And the printers themselves have gotten vastly uh, less expensive, and that's really helped um, uh, spur the explosion of, of printing and, and bioprinting in, in the field. So now it's, it's grown considerably over the last few years. Um, application in healthcare is the third largest sector in, in additive uh, manufacturing. So if you focus on the, the bio side of things, probably the, the largest uh, type of, of printing approaches that are utilized include lithographic-based approaches, inkjet, uh, laser centering, extrusion-based printing, and um, uh, laminate manufacturing. Our lab does um, most of its work in lithographic as well as extrusion-based printing, and um, I'm sure many folks are familiar here, but I just thought I'd say a, a few words from, from our point of view um, about these printing uh, approaches and techniques. And I have the uh, obligatory movie on the side here that you can watch while I'm talking. Uh, so this is a, a lithography-based uh, printing approach where you have a photocurable polymer resin. Um, a plane of light is shined up through the bottom of that, of that resin and cures the, the resin into thin layers repeatedly over time to build a three-dimensional object. Since it's light-based, it rel has relatively good precision, somewhere on the order of about 20 microns. And we can also use the light as a way to control the cross-linking and therefore the mechanical properties or perhaps even the degradative properties of, of material. Um, the fabrication is slow, so this little movie that I just showed, I think it takes about six or seven hours to build that little model, model heart. And as you also saw in the movie, it often requires the building of support structures for that object that you're creating. Um, the materials you can use are, are um, pretty vast, but they do need to be photocurable, so you can use things like modified PEG or different polyesters. We've also been doing a lot of work where um, we isolate ECM from, from tissues and use that as a basis of a, of a bioink in, in the lab. Um, it should be noted, though, if you're, if you're working with a polymer, um, some kind of polymer system, maybe you have a cross-linking monomer, you need to add some photo initiator to take that light energy and probably initiate radical polymerization. Um, that all makes sense. Uh, you probably also need to add at least one, if not two, photo inhibitors so you prevent diffusive cross-linking. So you, essentially you're, you're cross-linking this pixel here but not the adjacent pixel so you can get good precision in, in your objects. And the reason I kind of mention this is if you're, if you're using a, a polymer and a cross-linking monomer, uh, initiator and maybe two inhibitors, you now have a relatively complex system that you need to figure out. So it does take some time if you're developing a new new ink, a new polymer for printing, it does take some time to develop it um, for your specific ap application. Uh, as I mentioned to a couple folks during my visit, we often have people who come to our lab and say, I want to print this material. And we're like, yes, we're excited to work with you and help, help, you, help you on that, but it, but it might take some time to develop the the chemistry in the system. Um, oftentimes you may need to think about post-fabrication processing of whatever you, you've created. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Maryland's inside the DC Beltway, just a couple miles away is the FDA campus. Um, so we have a lot of interactions with, with FDA. We have students that spend all their time or half their time at FDA. And um, what may not be fully appreciated is FDA, particularly CDA, CDRH, Center for Devices and Radiological Health, they have basic research laboratories that help them in their regulatory mission. So we've been fortunate to have a number of projects in collaboration with investigators at FDA. And one question that they were interested in looking at is that if we use a lithographic-based printing <coughs> approach and we print an object in two different orientations, we're obviously going to get a very different lamellar structure 
how does that impact the mechanical properties of whatever we build? So we created some modular um, um, objects with them, and we were able to identify some uh, general, general characteristics that um, one may think about when you're building uh, objects using uh, lithographic uh, printing. Doing these kinds of studies and, and other work in the lab, um, we've tried to build some decision tree analyses that help folks, including our, ourselves, decide in this case what, what material to use in a particular printing application. So um, depending upon whether you're interested in cytocompatibility during printing, what cross-linking method, what temperature, and what kind of strength, those are kind of your decision points. Um, we suggest different materials that may be best, at least as a good starting point in your, your given ap application. So in addition to lithographic-based printing, we do a lot of extrusion printing. And again, we have the obligatory uh, movie here. This, this movie is manic, to say the least. Um, it's printing very fast. Um, a woman who's doing a project, I'm not gonna talk about it today, on building the nipple areolar complex for women who've had complete mastectomies. Um, but you see, she's printing uh, multiple materials. Um, some are cell-based, and also using a light-based um, cross-linking approach to cure the material di different layers. Um, the printing, the extrusion-based printing approach is, um, is, is very nice because it really allows for a cell-based cell printing. Uh, the resolution, since you are extruding fibers, is a little bit less, probably on the order, probably starts at about 100 microns and goes up uh, from there. Um, but you can incorporate a, a viable, functional, healthy cell population. Uh, the fabrication is fast, it's not that fast. <laughs> it's, it's on the order of maybe 10 minutes, not uh, 10 seconds. And again, you have a variety of materials that, that you can choose from. Probably our, our workhorse material is gelatin methacrylate as a, as a basic bio ink. Um, but again, we use a lot of ECM. Um, we do um, everything from uh, fibrin to, to collagen uh, to a lot of synthetic polymers as, as well. Uh, one thing you do, do need to um, keep in mind is that if you're extruding a, a, a material and that material encapsulates a cell population, you're probably imparting significant shear forces on that cell population. So you need to have some assessment of that, the impact of that shear, not only simply on the viability, but also the ultimate functionality of that cell population as you're, you're engineering that into your, your tissue model or a tissue construct or whatever the case may be. So similar, we've done some studies um, to characterize these approaches in extrusion-based printing. In this study, we looked at just simple uh, extrusion printing of, of PLGA. We looked at it at um, a variety of, of chemistries, so copolymer ratio, molecular weight, uh, NCAP chemistry, as well as printing conditions, pressure, temperature, speed, and pattern. And we did this for multiple needle diameters and just asked the simple question of, What's the fidelity of what we're getting um, when we print an object compared to the design of that object in, in CAD? Basically, what's the precision with which we can print uh, the material? In this study, we were able to show that at smaller needle diameters, some chemistry uh, uh, components, things like the copolymer ratio and the molecular weight, do become significant determinants of printing, printing precision um, when, when opposed to uh, larger needle diameters. Here we think um, the explanation for this is, if we all remember hagen Poisson flow, um, resistance to flow varies with the fourth power of radius. So basically as you get to smaller and smaller needle diameters, the resistance to, to flow of extrusion of the material goes up quite, quite a bit. And similarly, using these approaches, we've created some decision trees on how to choose the best uh, bioprinter for a given application based on the resolution you're willing to, to work with how long you're willing to, to print a material, as well as the cost of the, the printer it, it itself. Again, we think these are just uh, some good starting points that, that help us and um, hopefully help, help the field as, as well. So using these approaches, our lab works um, with a variety of different systems, uh, tissues. We do some work in the cardiovascular area, bone, cartilage, uh, dermal tissue, including the, uh, the nipple areolar complex uh, project I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have some work building models of the placenta and some work in, in using printing approaches to build bioreactors or dynamic uh, cell culture systems. So I'm gonna tell um, 
three or maybe four stories that kind of describe some of these projects that are ongoing in, in the lab. And um, you're going to help me with the, with the time. Just tell me if I'm going, going too long. So the, the first one is using printing approaches to build bioreactors for engineered bone models. Um, so when you think about bioreactors, they really got going in, in tissue engineering, regenerative medicine, um, with the idea that if I'm going to build something of any particular size in, in the lab, anything over you know, really mil, millimeters in scale, I need to create some dynamic culture system to keep that cell population alive. I can easily mold it or fabricate it, I can even, even print it, um, but if I'm not delivering uh, nutrients, oxygen at a, at a uh, steady rate to that cell population, it's just not going to survive by passive diffusion through media and through the construct. So the idea that we needed to build a bioreactor for dynamic culture has been out there for, for quite a bit of time. We also think that bioreactors can be viewed as a way to control the environment that cells and tissues and engineered tissues are, are growing in. So we can use a bioreactor to control the shear environment, um, perhaps control cell-to-cell -cell interactions, and even the formation of, of 3D uh, tissues, going from 2D planar tissues to, to 3D tissues. So the, the original idea of this work was how can we move from the, the PDM, PDM EDMS uh, systems, the SAM systems that are kind of ubiquitous in the field to something where we could um, use printing and the precision of printing to create complex culture systems. The, the um, kind of first generation of this was uh, just a simple flow chamber that um, we can print quite, quite easily. And in the flow chamber, we have an array of columns. The columns impart some shear on the fluid as it's passing through um, passing through the flow chamber. And obviously we can control the, the diameter of the columns, the spacing, the offset of the columns. So we can get different shear environments, um, be it homogeneous environments within the flow chamber or heterogeneous environments. So we can uh, print these constructs like you see here and then use them um, to ask some interesting biological <laughs> questions. And I, I should say in all of our work, um, we really try to use printing as a means to either make something that we can't easily make any other way, or to ask, even more importantly probably, or ask a biological question that we can't easily ask any other way. Sometimes in our, our field, there seems to be a lot of, um, it's maybe too strong of a word, but gratuitous use of printing, just printing stuff for the sake of printing it. Um, we're, we're very much of the idea that if you can mold something, you should mold it should always go with the easiest fabrication approach. Um, but if, if printing makes sense, by all means do it. But make sure you're using the capabilities of printing to localize materials or localize different cell populations um, so you can ask some interesting questions. So in this, this first generation, we were able to create these constructs in, in CAD um, using things like SolidWorks. SolidWorks has a very simple CFD module that you can add to it so that we can um, get some good handle on the, the flow environment and the shear environment within, within that construct. In this case, we took HMSCs, human mesenchymal stem cells. We added them to the flow chamber and just looked at them initially at day zero as well as um, through seven days of culture. This system's particularly nice. Um, we had built multi-layered systems with, which work really well, but they're difficult to interrogate. So this single layer system is very nice. We can put it onto the microscope and and look at things over time. But what we found initially was that uh, when we see the cell population, if you look, um, they have a tendency to grow at the interface. This is the column in, in the array. They have the um, tendency to grow at the interface between the bottom of the column and uh, the substrate it, itself. Over time, this was dissipated, and you saw it uh, less with, with higher flows. Um, but at day zero, you really um, did notice this, this effect. So this is actually a, a well-known effect. I, I wasn't aware of it. Um, the postdoc who was leading this work um, went back into literature and um, this was able to find this phenomenon. It's called negative curvature environments. So if you, if you think about different environments, the easiest one is a concave and con convex uh, system. And a, a concave system, the surface um, area, the volume of a cell is, is um, smaller in the concave versus the con convex. It's metabolically favorable for the cell to live in that environment versus a more spread environment. 
So in this case, uh, the negative curvature environment provided by the base of the um, pillar and the, the substrate is a, is a much more friendly environment for the cell compared to like a positive curvature or a, a neutral environment. So that explains the, the phenomena that we, that we see here. And finally, we're able to show that cells like this, the flow chamber and live in it and uh, grew, grew over time in a similar way as they did in static culture. We then went on to look at this uh, cell patterning or localization phenomenon a little bit uh, more deeply. We used something like cytocalicin to interrupt active polymerization and showed that um, that interrupted the, the cell localization next to the base of the pillars um, um, to, to a good extent. And we're able to also demonstrate that if we applied flow for, for a day, that also created a more homogeneous uh, cell uh, distribution when compared with uh, either static or, or short, short times. So then we asked the question, could we use this um, patterning effect to induce uh, cell differentiation in a, in a robust and also perhaps a, a pattern way? So we took the human mesenchymal stem cells, we induced their differentiation down to osteoblastic lineage using osteogenic uh, media, and used um, alkaline phosphatase expression as an early marker of, of differentiation. And we were able to show that we did see enhanced um, uh, ALP expression when grown under dynamic uh, uh, culture when compared to the static uh, condition. Um, yeah. then, then we asked the, the question, could we correlate this expression of ALP um, um, that we see among the cell population to spatial localization within the bioreactor chamber. Uh, so Josephine, who did this work, uh, uh, defined this very nicely. It's called a Pearson correlation coefficient. It looks very complicated, but all it essentially is doing is looking at the, the, um, the variance in shear and comparing that to the variance in ALP expression as we assess using uh, uh, quantitative uh, image analysis. So trying to compare these patterns of ALP expression to the patterns in, in shear. And what was able, uh, so uh, a positive correlation, you get a, a, a coefficient that's greater than one, a negative co correlation, you get a coefficient that's uh, between zero and negative one. I'm sorry, this is between zero and one. And no coefficient, no correlation, you see a, co a, a coefficient close to zero. And we're able to show that we do indeed see a, a, a reasonable correlation when grown under growth media. Um, however, that correlation is dissipated when we use osteogenic media that's driving um, uniform differentiation among all the cell, cell population. <coughs> Finally, we, we went back and um, using that localization effect, we thought that we could use that to our advantage <coughs> to create patterns of cell populations within the bioreactor. So if we seed HMSCs first, they like to attach near the base of these, these pillars. So that leaves the other spaces in the bioreactor available for subsequent cell populations. So we seed something like QVEX, and we start to get a, a patterning in our bioreactor system. And that's what's show, shown here. Um, distance away from the pillar, it's predominantly HMSCs close to the pillar, but as we get further and further away from the pillar, we see more and more QVEX. What's interesting is if you switch the seeding order, um, first QVEX and then HMSCs, since the QVEX are a little bit smaller, then the HMSCs, that 90 degree angle um, between the, the pillar and the substrate is not as favorable to them. So they tend to spread more homogeneously. And then therefore, if you add HMSCs afterwards, you get a homogeneous distribution of the HMSCs. If you were to take that pillar and put it on a little bit of a, an angle, so you get a smaller angle between it and the substrate, you do indeed get H, H, I'm sorry, HUVEC um, localization in that small angle environment. And finally, we just did some uh, calcium uh, signaling studies. Um, you can see them ongoing here of our different uh, uh, culture systems, uh, the stem cells alone, uh, endothelial cells alone, an unmixed co-culture and a mixed co-culture. And uh, really what we're just trying to show with, with these studies is that we can use this environment of the bioreactor to create relatively complex uh, cell systems of multiple cell populations and interrogate their, their response based on, on localization. So we're able to show that we get differences in oscillating uh, cell si calcium signaling and the, the number of, of calcium spikes, spikes as a function of these different uh, culture strategies. 
So ultimately we think these printed bioreactors have a lot of advantages. We can use the CAD design, the fluid dynamics to create environments that are particularly favorable to the cell population of, of interest. And then we can tweak them to get, in this case, uh, co-cultures or differentiation patterns um, that, that might be helpful in a given, given application. We've then um, taken this work and, and developed it further to, for specific applications, although that was in the context of bone. Um, this work, we're trying to create some uh, stratified scaffolds to regenerate uh, dermal tissue. So this project was led by a, a PhD student, um, Javier Navarro. Uh, Javier is originally from uh, Colombia, and he uh, was fortunate to get a Fulbright Fellowship to, to work in our lab. He recently graduated, and he's now uh, doing, doing a postdoc. And Javier made the observation that um, in the body, there are multiple sites where um, there are tissue types coming together, but they're coming together in a stratified way. Um, interfacial tissue engineering and gradient um, tissues have been looked at, um, led by work by like Helen Liu at, at Columbia for, for quite a few years. Um, but building multiple tissues simultaneously um, that have stratified layers have been investigated less, less often. So in this case, Javier was trying to um, build something that replicated the dermal tissue, adipose tissue layers that we see, see in skin. And the idea was that I wanted to create a culture system that cultured the dermal tissue and adipose tissue separately, but still allowed for molecular communication among these two cell, cell populations. So we did not want to create something where we got a gradient in this, um, this uh, reactor chamber, but something that was more stratified, where we had uh, the dermal-like tissue and the adipose-like tissue adjacent to one another, but the cells could still uh, communicate, there still could be transport of molecular cues between the two reactor chambers. Equally, we could culture the reactor chambers in, in separate media. We could do this in such a way so that the media either mixed over time, or we could do single pass media flows so we had completely separate media environments over time. So again, using a printing approach, uh, Javier built these bioreactor systems, and you can kind of see it here, it's about uh, yay big, it has two chambers um, that fit one on top of the other. The scaffold that he was using is just a simple uh, uh, cube-like scaffold with a, a lattice uh, structure, and then between the two chambers was a separating membrane, and I'll talk about that membrane in, in a second. So again, we use some CFD approaches to look at flow through the dual chamber bioreactor as well as mixing um, and the shear, shear environment, establishing that we could indeed uh, flow multiple uh, medias in the two chambers and uh, the mixing um, could be regulated by this pro the porosity of this, this membrane that we inserted between the, the two uh, scaffolds and the two, the two chambers. So building that membrane took a little bit of time since we were working in a dermal uh, application and we had a nice collaboration with a company from North Carolina that did a lot of work in keratin-based materials. Uh, we decided to build a, a keratin uh, membrane. Uh, this membrane is uh, photo cross-linked using a, a printing uh, approach and uh, the printing uh, chemistry strategy is just based on riboflavin, which is relatively common in, in the field. So Javier made the observation that uh, based on two key factors, uh, the, the amount of uh, exposure time, light exposure time, as well as the thickness of the construct, so how thick the membrane was, um, you essentially could use those to control the amount of energy that was imparted in the cross-linking of that, that membrane and then ultimately the, the stiffness or cross-linking of that membrane. So that's what's described here. So here are the two values. The first value is exposure time. The second value is membrane thickness. Um, and we showed that with, we could vary, uh, by varying these two parameters, we could vary the amount of energy that was delivered during the cross-linking reaction and roughly energy being correlated to uh, cross-linking of, um, of the keratin by the riboflavin uh, chemistry um, with these different energy uh, density deliveries. Using this, this approach, um, Javier then validated that we could use the membrane to control molecular communication uh, uh, through the membrane and ultimately to a cell population. 
So in the, um, first he characterized the swelling of the membrane, um, but then took the membrane, put it into a trans well, added uh, adipogenic molecules to the top of the, the trans well, and then human mesenchymal stem cells at, at the bottom, and using different uh, membrane types and ultimately different processes or cross linkings, um, was able to show that we can get different amounts of uh, lipid expression as a marker of adipogenic um, uh, differentiation by controlling the membrane type that was used in the, in the trans well. So then going back, he took these membranes that he's um, printed and, and created, put them back into the, to the bioreactor system, asked similar questions about, uh, about fluid mixing um, as a function of the porosity of the, the membranes. And essentially, is if you have a very, very tight membrane, you're not gonna get a lot of mixing uh, between the two chambers of the, the bioreactor. But as the porosity increases, we get more, more and more mixing. And you see this, this was uh, computationally done, and this is the experimental result that kind of validates that, that, that approach. Finally, getting to the real experimental um, work, um, the first kind of uh, test was taking fibroblasts, putting them in both uh, chambers, the upper lower chambers, so chamber A and B, the same, same kind of media, and then growing them over time and demonstrating that we get good, healthy, robust uh, fibroblast proliferation and matrix expression in the two chambers um, throughout a 28-day study. The next study was a little bit more of, of um, what, what we're hoping to do, where he took human mesenchymal stem cells, put them in both chambers in line A and line B, and then after seven days added adipogenic media, so media that would induce the adipogenic differentiation of the stem cells, um, put that in the, the top chamber in line, e, line A, and then looked at the differentiation of the stem cells in the bottom chamber in line B. The only way these cells should really be differentiating is because of the molecular <coughs> transport of these factors from the top chamber down to the, to the bottom chamber. And cultured these for, for 28 days and was able to demonstrate that he did indeed uh, find, again, as using lipid as a marker, lipid expression in both the top and the bottom chambers um, for multiple membrane types and um, correlating the expression to the membrane cross-linking or ultimately the membrane <coughs> porosity. The last thing that um, Javier was interested uh, in doing was this, this was a dermal project, particularly um, um, for patients who had uh, facial wounds. It was really interest in trying to create complex uh, dermal uh, structures. So up until this time, the interface between these, these two chambers was a flat plane, and Javier was interested in creating more complex things where you get some, some curvature um, between the, these two chambers. So the idea was how do we build in some um, structural complexity between the, between the two chambers. And he did this using the, the membrane approach and the shape of the scaffolds that went into the, into the two chambers. So you can see the kind of design here and then ultimately how it fit together in the bioreactors that, that he built. So this was kind of an interesting um, kind of spatial study where um, he's just using fluid dye to uh, illuminate the bottom chamber and did this as a function of, of membrane um, shape. So here you can see a, a single continuous scaffold with no membrane separating uh, the upper and lower chamber. This is not the membrane, this is a rubber gasket that separates the, the two chambers. Um, so here's a single continuous scaffold and you see the dye diffusing across. Here's a, a, a two different scaffolds but with a, a membrane a very uh, tight membrane that's preventing diffusion from the bottom chamber up to the top. And here's a, um, a membrane where we have, um, it's, uh, the percentage is, is done by uh, space, but a 25% um, curved scaffold that's separating the two, um, two chambers. You can start to see some structure in the bottom, the bottom chamber is equal, you can see that in the, the top chamber. When you extend that curvature, when you make it even more um, pronounced, you actually start to see some, some dead zones in the, in the bottom uh, uh, scaffold. It's just the, the curvature is too, too, uh, too much for simple diffusion, a little bit of convection to fill this, this bottom chamber. 
So Javier then uh, validated this using a, a, a cell, because the previous work was just looking at a dye and validated this using a, a cell approach and again was able to demonstrate the cells uh, survived and proliferated in these, these complex environments. And then finally did some quantitative uh, analysis again of in this case using a diplomectin as, as a marker and then as a function of, of these different, different approaches. Ultimately, um, we think this is a really uh, exciting approach to use a, a, a membrane and a, a printed bioreactor to control the structure and uh, the growth of, of tissues that have complexity, not only in their stratified nature, nature but also the geometry of that, that stratified nature. Um, we're able to show that we can, to, can sustain and grow multiple cell populations um, adjacent to one another, um, but still supporting communication across those, those multiple cell populations. Ultimately, as I mentioned, this, the application of this work is to build um, uh, complex dermal structures um, to be fined in, in the face, but doing it in such a way that we can build in the stratified layers of the dermal tissue it's, itself. So let's see. What time should I, I got maybe like 10 minutes? Yeah, five, 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 ten minutes. Five to ten minutes. Um, I'll just tell one more. I'll tell one more story on the placenta, and then I'll stop. I'll stop there. So um, I mentioned that we're relatively close to FDA on the other side of us, down towards DC, um, about halfway between us and the, the White House is the Children's National Medical Center. And we we're fortunate to to start a collaboration with folks at, at Children's that looked at placental biology. So just very, very briefly, um, as we all know, the placenta is a regulator of communication from maternal to, to fetal uh, uh, tissue, and it's made up of a series, essentially you could think of it as a series of resistance to, to transport um, from the maternal blood down to the, to the fetal blood. So we have uh, multiple cell types, uh, uh, trophoblast, cytotrophoblast, and ultimately down to endothelial cells. There are, um, for a number of reasons, there aren't really good animal models for the human uh, placenta. So what's often done is either transwell studies or ex vivo culture of the placenta. So taking a term placenta and then perfusing that and working that as a, as a tissue model. Um, it also needs to be emphasized too that a nine month term placenta does not act does not function in the same way as a two-month uh, placenta or a four four-month uh, placenta. Um, the cell population, the matrix, it's all com completely different. Um, so that kind of motivated us uh, to try to create a, a printed model of the placental tissue. We felt like um, we we can work with materials, cell populations. We can put them together in a in a relatively precise um, way. This is something that we can easily build and allow us to add, ask some questions about placental biology. So our first kind of go at building a, a model of the placenta is this tri-layer structure that you see here. Um, we took two, um, they might be somewhat imperfect uh, um, trophoblast cell lines, what are known as B1B30 cells. Um, a monolayer of those were our uh, model for this in situ uh, trophoblast at the, at the top of the model. Then a, a hydrogel that had um, um, the same cell type, the same BWO cells distributed through it was, was the middle layer. And at the bottom is a layer, a monolayer of endothelial cells. Um, in this case, we're using cubets. If you take a cross section of that, that um, printed model you, and uh, image it, you see something here, something that looks like this, where here are the endothelial sides on the um, cubex on the endothelial sides, the BWOs on the, the trophoblast side. You don't see the, um, the cytotrophoblasts uh, distributed here, not because they're not here, but just because the, the cell density is so, so much lower. So we used this, this construct. Um, first, we needed to, to validate it. Um, we looked at questions such as the tightness of the monolayers on the top and bottom of the construct. We looked at this both by uh, imaging as well as looking at resistance uh, using tier approaches um, to, to demonstrate that we were getting um, mostly relatively tight um, monolayers on the top and the bottom of the construct. Um, we also asked questions about whether the cells themselves were acting as they would uh, native, natively. 
So um, both the VWO cells and the QVEX, were they accept, uh, expressing key markers like HCG? HCG is a protein that's assayed in, in um, pregnancy kits. Um, progesterone and things like VEGF, and we're able to demonstrate that the, the cells are excreting factors as they normally would, um, at least in, in, in cell culture. So we use these, uh, these constructs um, to ask a variety of different questions. Um, kind of standard transport questions, how do things move from the maternal side to the fetal side, um, more complex things, disease transmission, and then finally looking at the um, effects of medications that moms might be taking during, during pregnancy and how they, how they might affect fetal development. I should emphasize, we can look at um, the response of the model placental tissue itself so we can take, uh, let's say, a prescription drug and look at the response of that cell population, but we can also take that model, um, put it into a trans well on top of, uh, now this is now a third cell type that's in model layer, so we could put some like fetal cardiomyocytes at the bottom and ask questions about how drugs might be metabolized by the model placental um, um, tissue and how that might affect the, the fetal cardio cardiomyocytes. And we've done all these studies. So briefly, um, we're able to, to demonstrate like transport of things like glucose, um, which is relatively quick through the model, as well as larger molecules like IgG uh, through the model, model and get some idea of diffusion coefficients. Um, in collaboration with a group in, uh, at George Washington University um, who are uh, experts in Zika virus, we were able to do some Zika virus um, studies where we showed that the Zika virus um, did indeed pass through our placental model, but some um, uh, agents, things like chloroquine, uh, could inhibit that. Then when we took this placental model, put it on top of neural uh, progenitor cells, uh, we were able to show that um, the, the model itself does inhibit Zika virus uh, uh, transport, as you would hope, as you would expect it uh, to do, when compared to just taking that Zika virus and directly adding it to the neural um, progenitor cells. Finally, we looked at the response of uh, some prescription uh, medications that may be taken, in this case for antidepressant uh, medications that might be taken um, um, by moms during, during pregnancy. And again, looking at responses both of the model itself as well as um, um, uh, subsequent cell populations below, below the model. We're able to show that the model uh, differentially uh, controlled transport of, of two, different, two different drugs and that the drugs could be taken up by the barrier cells and then slowly released to fetal cells um, subsequent to that, to that uptake. So I have one other story, but I think I'll, I'll stop here. I do want to say that um, um, we were very fortunate uh, a couple of years ago uh, to receive a uh, center grant from NIH. Um, the center is called the Center for Engineering Complex Tissues. Um, this center is it's a P41 mechanism, um, so we, we're doing it in collaborations with folks at, at Rice as well as folks at Wake Forest. Um, the folks at Rice are, folk, are building uh, scaffolds with complex structure. The folks at Wake Forest are fo focusing on uh, cell printing, and we're doing our bioreactor culture, some of the studies that I described um, earlier. But these um, centers, the P41 centers, are really meant to build a community around a te technology. Um, so there are a number of ways that you um, folks can interact with us um, through what are known as either collaborative projects or, or service projects. Um, the distinction between these two is not so important right now, um, but what ultimately what I'm trying to get to is if there are opportunities to work with anyone here, we'd be very excited to do so. Um, so for like our component, if there are bioreactor systems that we can build for you, um, if there are ways that we can help you build uh, uh, systems, if um, folks want to come to our lab and, and train, uh, we can do that as well. We'd be very excited to, to explore those opportunities uh, with anyone. Um, so this is just a, another slide on, on the center and my email address in case um, um, anybody would like to connect with me. And our, it's called CC, or, and uh, the website's um, address is right there as well. And there are um, plenty of information on, on the website um, to, uh, to connect with us. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge um, the students that work in, in the lab. So we 
Uh, we heard about the, the bone bioreactor study that was led primarily um, by Josephine Lebon. Uh, Josephine was an outstanding uh, postdoc in our lab. She did her PhD at, at Princeton and then joined us. She now works for a small company just north of us called Rooster Bio. Um, if you're familiar with Rooster Bio, they um, are selling uh, M MSCs, mesenchymal stem cells, at, at large scale for clinical and, and other applications. Um, then we heard about the uh, placental work that was done by Vincent Kuo, as well as uh, Naveen um, on the placental work, and then the um, dermal tissue work was done by Javier uh, Navarro. I'd really like to acknowledge all, all of our financial uh, support, and thank you so much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. seems to basically alter even the geometry of the endothelial cells. Endothelial cells kind of orient themselves to the flow, so sure. there's shear dependency, but there also seems to be that cyclic stretch dependency where, um, you know, for example, growth factors like VEGF and uh, release of uh, production of one milligram factor and a number of other things are related to cyclic stretch, not just shear. And so you have this, uh, we've been trying to uh, We've even had a co-culture model where we have smooth muscle cells and endothelial cells uh, to create a vascular model to study this. Clinically, you know, it affects patients with uh, these ventricular assist devices because they don't have a pulse. Right. So the, the cyclic stretch is absent and they end up with uh, uh, bleeding issues in yeah. the system. And so we've, so we've done um, a number of studies looking at what's really the best endothelial cell type to start with, QVEX not probably the best. So we've done some work on EPCs. We're doing some work with uh, IPS-derived endothelial-like cells uh, now. So we focused on that. But I, I definitely agree with you. Um, we have some efforts right now to build uh, some of these bioreactor systems that can impart um, cyclic stretch or a, different, a variety of mechanical stimulations to our cultures. And we hope to have those up and running you know, shortly because this is something we often get get asked and, um, you know, as I mentioned, it's the, kind of the role in the center. We'd really like to be able to provide these um, uh, for, for our applications, but also for the community as well. We have those systems and we can talk to Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. 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 So um, when you're talking about 3D printing with like placing, selectively placing different cell types and stuff, um, do you know if anyone has worked with also having the ability to selectively place like um, signaling factors or you know cytokines or, or you know anything like that for you. Yeah, so I, I didn't mention it, it I, um, but we've done that like in our placental studies. Mm -hmm. um, we did some trophoblast migration studies. Um, you know, there's this whole story when um, the, the placenta is embedded in the uterine wall um, uh, cell populations of the trophoblasts migrate and um, allow for the expansion of vasculature that ultimately provides increased mm -hmm. nutrition as the fetus is, is developing. So there's some, a lot of questions about what's driving that trophoblast mi migration. So what we did was print, um, we, we just did a circular disk so that the geometry and the math is simple. Uh, the print circular disks where we at a growth factor in a particular spot, we're able to track its diffusion out radially, and then therefore the cell migration in towards that, that um, spot. We think these applications are great for printing. You know, yeah. Put something where we want to and ask a question uh, about it, and we really, really try, to, try to focus on that. Yeah? So do you do uh, sort of reaction diffusion modeling along with like, maybe uh, modeling aspects of cellular metabolism to, to build these systems? We haven't done a lot of that. That's a good good point. Um, we haven't gotten to probably that level of sophistication. Um, we really focused on uh, fluid environment and shear as kind of our main components. Um, I, should, I should mention too, you know, you design things in CAD 
and then you print them, you can run the flow simulations off your CAD design, or you can take the object, uh, do a micro CT, so you really get a good handle on what you actually printed, not what you hoped you printed, and then do those, those same studies. We're doing a lot of those questions uh, now as kind of our, our next iteration, because there is some distinction between what you design and what you ultimately Thank you so much. So, thank you.